Well, assuming that it came out on time, I can say good afternoon to you. And what a privilege it is to come here and share God's word with you uh, this Lenten season. I'm Pastor Meisek. I'm from Zion in Pestigo. And I'm happy to be here to continue our travel as we're looking at God on trial. That's who Jesus is. God on trial for you and me. Now the service we're following is printed for you in the service folder. Uh, you'll be able to follow along there. We're going to begin now with our opening hymn. It's hymn number 515, Christ is the World's Light.
We pray. Lord God, support us all the years of our lives, that we may follow your gracious will, both in good times and bad, that our lives may be an unending testimony to your love and faithfulness, to your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, we'll continue with our responsive reading of the past history. Uh, you'll be able to follow along on your insert this afternoon. And so we begin with Lesson 5. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. He said to them, You brought this man to me as one who was misleading the people. Look, I have examined him in your presence. I have found in this man no basis for the charges you are bringing against him. Herod did not either, for he sent him back to us. See, he has done nothing worthy of death, so I will have him flogged and release him. At the, At the time, time of the festival, the governor had a custom to release to the crowd any one prisoner they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner named Barabbas, who had been thrown in prison for a rebellion in the city and for murder. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So when they were assembled, Pilate said to them, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? Which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For Pilate, in fact, knew they had handed Jesus over to him because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, Pilate's wife said to him, I have nothing to do with that righteous man, she said, since I have suffered many things today in a dream because of it. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask the Lord to rest and to have Jesus put to death. The governor asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They all shouted together with one voice, Take him away, release Barabbas to us. Pilate said to them, Then what do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? What should I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said to him, Crucify him. But the governor said, Why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting even louder, Crucify him. Pilate addressed them again, because he wanted to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. He said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no grounds for sentencing him to death, so I will whip him and release him. But they kept pressuring him with loud voices, demanding that he be crucified, and their voices were overwhelming. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him off. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. They also kept hitting him in the face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no basis for a charge against him. When Pilate heard this speech, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the place, the palace again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate asked him, Are you not talking to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you or to crucify you? 
Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, I will try to release Jesus. But the Jews shouted, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down in the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, or Gabbatha, in Aramaic. It was about the sixth hour on the preparation day for the Passover. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, and that instead it was turning into a riot, he decided that the man would be done. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and then said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Since he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. So then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. After they had mocked him, the soldiers took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Jesus was carrying his own cross. As they were going out of the city, a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was going by with him. They placed the cross on him and made it to carry behind Jesus. A large crowd of people was following him, including women who were born and women who were He just turned to them and said, Daughter of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. But this for yourselves and for your children. Be sure of this. The day is coming when they will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never gave birth and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things to the green wood, what will happen to the dry? This is the word of our Lord. We now continue with our next hymn, hymn number 399, My Song is Love Unknown.
God that we want to consider today for our meditation comes to us from Luke chapter 22. We'll be reading verses 47 through 53. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd appeared. A man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He came near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was about to happen, they said to him, Lord, should we strike with a sword? Then one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus responded, Stop! No more of this. Then he touched the servant's ear and healed him. Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who came out against him, Have you come out as you would against a robber with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour, when darkness rules. Says the word of the Lord. So you feel the pressure building up in your chest. Your heart rate is going up. Your blood pressure is rising. Your temperature is going up too. Respiration. Your perspiration are increasing. You've been wronged. Now what are you going to do about it? <coughs> On Thursday of Holy Week, Jesus and his disciples were, were gathered there together in the upper room in Jerusalem. And he told them that they were about to be seen, or they were about to see him be treated as a common criminal. He also warned them that their lives, that their ministries, were never going to be the same. Now, they're going to be difficult. They have been welcomed into homes and accepted by people. But from now on, he told them, you're going to face hostility. Didn't take the disciples very long to, to get a glimpse of what that was like, did they? When the Passover meal was over, Jesus led his disciples out of the Garden of Gethsemane. You heard what happened. As he took his disciples there, a detachment of soldiers, guided by some Jewish leaders and led by someone they knew very well, Judas, came out to meet him. But never fear because the disciples are ready. Peter grabs his sword and starts swinging, and in the process, hacks off the ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus rebukes him, though. He says, No more of this. And then he healed the man's ear. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong, had he? We know that very well. And as that mob came up to him, they came as a mob who you would expect to be carrying away a murderer, someone who was very guilty of some heinous crimes. But Jesus hadn't engaged in any violent insurrection. In fact, Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. No misdemeanor, no crime whatsoever. In fact, if he was guilty of anything, they could have picked him up at any time. But Jesus knew. Jesus knew why they came under the cover of darkness. Because they had no legitimate case. They came because this is mob justice. This is bribery. This is collusion. And it's worst. It's completely unfair. So what did Jesus do? Well, I'll tell you. A man who can heal a second year. I think he has a few options in his bag, don't you? He could have called down a legion of angels to fight in his defense. In fact, John tells us that when Jesus, or when they came looking for him, and they asked if he was Jesus, and he said, I am he, he said, in awe, in amazement that they hit the ground, they fell back. So with one word, Jesus really could have brought it all to an end. But instead, he didn't. Why? Why did he pick up the heel ear and heal the man who detained him? Because Jesus exercised restraint. Perfect, holy restraint. He did that for us. Restraint, we, we know what it is, right? It's that ability to, to hold back when every fiber in our being tells us we need to lash out, we need to do something, we need to say something. Especially in a circumstance where you feel wrong. How do you deal with unwarranted criticism? 
What's your first reaction when someone accuses you of doing something that you didn't do? Or, what are people going to do when they say all kinds of things and it's not going their way? We know very well restraint isn't something that is our first inclination in life, is it? Why is it so difficult? Well, very simply, it's because we like to think of ourselves first, don't we? How did this hurt me? What did I do to deserve all of this? Why did they think of my needs and how this would make me feel? It's about our pride. It's about our dignity. It's about that sense of justice that we feel is owed to us. We feel like we're on trial. We feel defensive. And then, because of that, we feel that we need to defend ourselves. And so that pressure, that pressure builds up. It, it gets stronger. Our heart rate gets going. Our blood pressure skyrockets. And all we can think about is getting rid of that feeling. Wanting whatever we can do to make it all feel better. Oh, yeah, maybe we don't swing the sword like Peter was. But you know what? We lash out with our tongues quite quickly. You know, we fire off that angry text, that angry email. Well, we leave a very bitter comment, letting them know our thoughts in the comment box. And we glare and we fight back and we sin. And Jesus comes to you and me and says, no more of this. And then he heals. You know, look at Jesus. He wasn't thinking about himself at all. He wasn't thinking about the fact that he had absolutely done nothing to deserve this. But he was thinking about you and me. Now just looking at this man where he had put the bleeding ear back onto him and healed him, Jesus didn't look at him and see him as an enemy, someone to be defeated, someone to be wiped out. He looked at him as a dearly loved soul who had a name. And in fact, John in his gospel tells us his name is Malchus. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus stood there and he told the people, love your enemies. But we all know very well, it's one thing to tell you something, it's an entirely different thing to show you. That's what Jesus did. He showed us exactly what it is and what it means to love our enemies. Now, Jesus wasn't thinking of himself, was he? He was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. You know, that, that path to our salvation, it, it led through this unholy mob there in that garden. Restraint really is one of the themes of Jesus' entire passion. He stood at the garden as that perfect Lamb of God, the servant who had come to open his mouth, not to hurt or to harm, but to give himself over willingly for your sins and mine. His restraint, it was there on display as he stood before Pilate and Herod and the chief priests and the Sanhedrin and all those who were standing there accusing him of things he did not do. And never once did he lash out in his temper. Never once did, did he call down curses from heaven upon them. Even as he's being nailed to the cross, we remember what he said. His father, forgive them. You and I, we need this Jesus to be our Savior. We need his quiet and purposeful obedience to his Father's will. We need his perfection. We need his holiness. We need his righteousness so we can stand before our Father in heaven. And that's, that's exactly what Jesus came to give us, to do for us. He gave us his righteousness, his holiness, so that we can stand before God as his dearly loved children. And we need his example, too. We live in a world where that quick comeback and that, that hurtful zinger, that demeaning answer, are all rewarded. A good pat on the back, a, a good chuckle among co-workers. Social media is the worst of it. Talk shows, news shows, they, they thrive on those inflammatory responses all because they want to gain more viewers and secure a loyal audience. Those social media algorithms, well, they're designed to target your indignation. They want you to get all worked up. They want you to get mad and to engage. And we begin thinking that if we don't respond, if we don't say something, you know, 
we don't lash out, they're not going to listen. They're not going to hear us and what I have to say because what I have to say is so important. My question for you today is this. What if we did something different? What if we as Christians acted differently? A young man in his 20s was shot. Uh, he spent a couple months in a coma and on life support before he died. A small group were gathered there at the Lutheran church, and it's time to start, but his mother wasn't there yet. Finally, those in, ten in attendance heard screaming and shouting, all coming from the back. It was his mother. She was hysterical. She was shouting at her daughter and the rest of her family, swinging her arms, threatening them, calling them thieves or murderers and killers because they took her son off of life support, even though he absolutely had no chance of surviving without it. But still screaming and threatening, she ran to the front of the church, threw herself over the casket. When the funeral directors came close to try and close the casket, she, she started hitting them. After what seemed like an eternity, she ran outside to the hearse, still screaming and crying and threatening everyone. And as she stood at the hearse, an attendee came up. Someone she didn't know, someone she had never met before. And that person threw her arms around her and said, it was an honor to know your son. He was a good kid. It was a privilege to know him. Their shoulders dropped. The tension eased just a little. And then, then another woman walked up and did the same thing. There's peace. There's grace in their words. There was Christian love and restraint. That, that quiet act, those quiet words, said and did a lot more than the screaming could ever accomplish. And so, imagine the impact that you can have in this overcharged world that we live in where restraint is all but a lost heart. You know Jesus, and you know the one who showed love. You know the one who showed restraint in all things as he made his way to the cross to die for your sins and mine. You know Jesus. You know that he is in control of all things and, and working together for the good of all his people, and you know that that can make a difference. You, we, all of us, we can use our words to heal and help instead of using them to inflame and destroy. We, we can think of the hurt that others feel rather than the hurt that they cause us. We can respond graciously, not impulsively, when we're provoked by the people around us. You know, our world likes to look at that behavior and interpret it as weakness. But the truth is, that takes the greatest strength, doesn't it? It takes strength that can only come from our Savior, who, who walked that very path before us. And in the garden, Jesus' power, it's seen as that miraculous healing, for which it is, but his strength is really, truly seen in the restraint that he offers that day. Yeah, the world likes to tell us you have the right to fight back. But when we're wrong, Look at what Jesus did. Jesus set aside justice for himself out of love for you and me. You know, have you ever thought of what Malchus thought that night walking away from the garden after what he saw? When we're wronged, it's good for us to remember that we operate from a position of strength. God has declared you righteous. God has declared you forgiven. You don't need to prove anything anymore. Because we know ultimately his plan, too, is going to prevail. So we don't have to be in control of each and every situation. He's with us, so we don't stand alone. We can be a light in this world where darkness is really seeming to overcome. And when we swing the sword, it's not the sword like Peter, but we swing the sword of the gospel. We let God's word change hearts. And then maybe, 
maybe through this strange behavior in this world's eyes, others will come to know Jesus and the love that he has for them. Yes, we get to be different. Amen. Please stand. May that peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may now be seated as we continue with the offering.
And the other joy is I get to see faces that I recognize every year, people that come to know that are not in my congregation, and a reminder that we're here together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So Lord, blessings today and always as you go about every single day, remembering to show the restraint that your Lord showed. I know it's hard. We like to lash out. We like to have that last word. But let's follow Jesus' example and show restraint to those around us. Have a great week.